This class is on the last lecture on the module of NDT techniques which are used in uh, machinery condition monitoring and uh, today I will be discussing about uh, techniques of radiography, dye penetrant test and uh, finally, visual inspection which is also done and necessary for uh, machinery condition monitoring to know the status of a machine component in terms of whether cracks and defects have occurred, whether voids are there, whether the weld has been perfectly done etcetera. So, let us first look into what this uh, radiography is. Radiography is otherwise also known as the x-ray technique. So, basically just to recap I mean uh, uh, we had in NDT also looked into ultrasonic thermography <coughs> eddy current and then uh, today we will be looking into radiography which is nothing but x rays and gamma rays <coughs> and then of course dye penetrant and visual inspection. Okay. This is what we are going to do. Now, <coughs> the if I take the look at the electromagnetic spectrum, ultrasonics uh, sorry uh, thermography was mostly by IR waves, ultrasonic was by wave beyond 20 kilohertz or in the megahertz range to be precise. Of course, there was one acoustic emission also, which is again in the range of maybe 2 to 5 megahertz and ID current of course, it depends on the magnetic field. But looking at the frequencies of ultrasonic thermo uh, IR waves and the acoustic emission, these waves x rays and gamma rays are very, very high frequency waves. They are of course, uh, they are all electromagnetic waves. However, their wavelengths are very small compared to the wavelengths of IR waves, ultrasonic and eddy uh, acoustic emission. So, because the wavelengths are small, they are in fact smaller than the interatomic uh, distances. Okay. So, they, they carry high energy or uh, let us see what is the characteristics. So, this characteristics of x rays and gamma rays are they have a much much lower wavelength than the visible light. As you know visible light has an wavelength from 4000 to 7000 angstrom and infrared somewhere uh, between you know 9 1000 to 1400 uh, 14000 angstrom, but compared to that they are on the other end of the spectrum where the wavelengths are very very less and of course, they travel in straight line they contain high energy okay. and the best part is they cannot be deflected or changed by the presence of any electrical or magnetic field. However, since they have such high energy in them, they can penetrate metals materials and this penetration power of this waves uh, of this uh, x rays or gamma rays depends on the, the <coughs> frequency of that particular wave and of course, 
the material density also comes into play and their intensity of course, obeys the inverse square law like we have in the case of optics, like in the case of acoustics and they are highly dangerous because they can penetrate any materials. They can also endanger human beings who operate this equipment and they can enter uh, and uh, destroy the cells of the human body and then can cause irreparable permanent damage if the exposure of the human cells to these waves x-rays are there for a longer time or for a um, at a shorter distance because of the inverse square law. So, one has to be very careful while using x-rays and gamma rays. I will I'll come to how what is the difference between <coughs> x-rays and gamma rays. So, the way x rays are produced is uh, suppose an uh, atom is there and then there are electrons on the outer cells and if uh, energy is applied to these atoms, what happens through an uh, electrical uh, field? These <coughs> atoms in the k shell, uh, these electrons in the k shell will come down to a lower state okay and but since this is a unstable stage or unstable orbit they will emit they will uh, bounce back and they'll emit certain waves uh, which are essentially x rays so one atom of a material has to be bombarded with uh, electrical energy and then these x rays will be produced okay as opposed to gamma rays are something because of radiation of certain materials of certain materials this is gamma rays in the, the alpha beta gamma rays <coughs> they are radioactive okay and of course a small quantity of uh, radioactive material can be used to produce these rays they are uh, they are because of a nuclear radiation they are harmful if not care for but they have more energy more penetration power and if this waves are carefully controlled through proper optics and electronics and focused onto a particular spot. They can be used for uh, many fusion operations, cutting operations etcetera. In fact, you know you, you must have heard of the gamma rays used in surgery, okay, but they are radioactive that that is the that is the factor for which we have to be careful while using gamma rays for uh, NDT though people use it because a small amount of nuclear material can be used to generate gamma rays and then they can be controlled and used for NDT testing okay because the key word be it x rays or gamma rays is that we use the energy of these waves to penetrate a material. Now, what happens like we had in the case of ultrasonics suppose, <coughs> suppose we have a material where there is a void okay, that is of a different density or we have a foreign particle of another density of a higher density. So, if the x rays are incident on this material they are going to penetrate okay and because of the density difference what happened the intensity of the x rays at this location will be different 
than this location. So, if we have some sort of an photograph we played and then we will we will maybe I will, if I draw this on the top view here, I will get an image as to this some image this is another image. So, this is the shadow if you can say so of the uh, foreign particle or the void present in the material and this is very handy. This is similar to the <coughs> x rays which uh, the doctors do for example, no, for the uh, human hand I mean we, we can find out the bones okay, by an x ray x ray because this is the flesh and this is the so called bone. So, there will be a density difference. So, the <coughs> penetration of this x rays depend on couple of things and that is the power of the x ray in terms of the distance from the x ray source to the material, in terms of the time of exposure of this material to the x ray waves and then with this image can be formed on an x ray film or like photographic film or nowadays of course, you know people are using computers uh, digital imaging to capture this x ray images and then of course, uh, you know, there is a method known as tomography okay, wherein you can have a, a digital image captured uh, through a um, computer of the x rays which are incident on a material. So, uh, to summarize the properties of x rays and gamma rays which makes them useful for use in NDT is because they have low wavelength, high frequency, they can travel in straight paths, they have high energy, they can penetrate materials, obey the inverse square law and they are risk to human being if not cared for. So, this property of x rays help us in using them for NDT techniques. So, what is this radiography? The radiography radiation used in radiography testing is a high energy shorter wavelength version of the electromagnetic waves that we see as visible light. The radiation can come from an x ray generator or a radioactive source. So, if I look at this electromagnetic spectrum here, this is our visible range right here, below that is the infrared and then the microwaves and radio waves. These have a little higher uh, wavelengths of course, then lower frequency as opposed to we have the EV rays which have a higher frequency than the visible lights, then we have the x rays and the gamma rays. So, the gamma rays shorter wavelength more powerful, x rays a little less powerful than the gamma rays and uh, this is how they are positioned in the electromagnetic spectrum. Now, mind you the speed of all the waves is the same as the speed of electromagnetic waves and that is 3 into 10 to the power 8 meters per second. Now, how is this x rays generated? Okay. So, what we have here is an uh, animation of this there are two electrodes you know one uh, as an anode and a cathode. Okay. So, we generate a very very high voltage we pass on high voltage which could be you know few few uh, thousand uh, kvs kilovolts okay, of energy and then this uh, is you know that in, the, in terms of electron electron volts you know, maybe uh, 10000 100000 electron volts so because of this material they will x rays will be generated and because we give such high energy to this electrode here it gets heated up okay and usually tungsten is used as one of the anodes which generate the x ray so there's a tungsten 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 uh, um, metal uh, element here but because of the high energy this gets uh, heated up and for the generation it is usually they, this will get oxidized so this chamber is actually a vacuum okay with a, a nice glass and then uh, this electrode has to be cooled. So, there are two important elements in an x ray generator. One is the high 
voltage source, other is the tungsten electrode, then we have the vacuum tube, then we have the cooling system, because we will have the focusing system. And of course, the exposure and exposure control and the electronics control and associated electronics. So, an X ray generator needs to have all these components. And finally, we have a material on which these x rays are exposed. So, we will get an exposure recording device could be a film, could be a digital image okay. and that is what uh, it is. Uh, though, uh, in the we have to bring in the component whose uh, x ray is to be done to a facility where this x ray generators are there, but there are also portable x-ray generators in the field, which uh, can be used to uh, do the in situ x-rays, but uh, I understand they are not very convenient and uh, are not very uh, user friendly in that sense that I can take the x-rays uh, to the field. Uh, but the component particularly in NDT, suppose we have a boiler tube. Okay. Suppose, there are some scale formations, okay. we can do the, uh, I had mentioned to you regarding the ultrasonic to measure the thickness, but they can have an x ray exposed to this. So, radiography of boiler tubes is one application where x rays are done. Okay. Now, the because the eventually everything depends on the energy. So, that depends on two important factors distance and time. Time by time I mean the exposure time, but again suppose uh, we have to be very careful while handling x rays and uh, more careful while handling gamma rays because gamma rays are radioactive. So, we have to have good amount of shielding. So, that of course, the human beings are not exposed to the industrial x rays. Okay, you, th this, this x rays we have the medical x rays and the industrial x rays. See, medical x rays uh, are the x rays which we used in the hospitals, supposed to find out a broken uh, bone of a person, whether the bones are intact, whether there is a fracture. So, that is what we use it in the medical x rays, where the energy of the x rays are less because the density of the bones or human flesh is much less than the density of certain industrial materials like steel, aluminum, copper, etcetera. So, these are of high energy. Now, you can well imagine if this industrial x ray is uh, exposed uh, to a human being, the cells <coughs> may get damaged permanently. So, one has to be very, very careful. Even while <coughs> doing the medical x rays, those of you who have experienced medical x rays, you would have seen how the, the <coughs> operator takes care that he is not. Uh, unknowingly exposed to x-rays, because another dangerous things about x-rays is they cannot be seen, seen, heard, smelt. Okay. So, this is very dangerous x-rays. So, not that 
a flash of light will go and then you have an x-ray. It is not that. So, x-rays cannot be seen, heard, smelled. So, this is, this is the important parameter which we have to keep in mind while handling x-rays. Okay, we would not know whether an x-ray has been generated standing in front of the equipment. So, we have to be very, very careful. Okay. Now, because <coughs> the industrial x-rays are of high energy, we have to be careful. And usually, uh, one particular um, thing or guard people use is this lead or any material of a higher density. Okay, which can absorb the x rays. Okay. You would have seen x rays you know, uh, you in, in the airport security systems. Okay. Uh, of course, there are uh, portable uh, gamma detectors also, portable handheld. gamma detectors they are radioactive though okay airport security systems for uh, screening luggages or baggages we use the x rays there and they are industrial x rays again so because the idea is if there is a density difference you can notice it for example if in your suitcase uh, there is a heavy metal okay or uh, there is a soft liquid so the the the, the patterns will be different in the x-ray images okay? and that is how uh, people can identify objects which are hidden and not visible from the outside. Okay? That is something uh, again which is powerful. Unlike the eddy current, eddy current is for surface defect. Okay? Ultrasonic has less power than X rays. X rays, these, are, these, these both are can find out internal defects. Okay. More power. And then, of course, we have the gamma rays, which are radioactive. And of course, acoustic emission is only when internal, but only when material is stressed or loaded, is stressed. or loaded. So, this is to give you a relative comparison of all the NDT techniques. Of course, thermography is nothing but a surface temperature monitoring. So, now you can <coughs> understand the relative applications of different things, different NDT techniques which are used to know the status of a machine components. It may not be an entire machinery, but individual critical components, their physical condition, their uh, current condition can be known by using such uh, techniques and we just talked about uh, x-rays. So, what happens in this x-ray is the part is in between the radiation source and a piece of film. Okay. The part will stop some of the radiations, thicker and more dense area will stop more of radiation that is what is in the film radiation. So, if I have a defect here and the film that is what it will look like. So, this has been exposed less and more and so on and then we can have certain materials as uh, guide plates. So, that uh, there are uh, in fact ASTM standards as to what are the calibration standards as well. Okay, which are available for uh, this x-rays. 
Okay. By the way, many of these uh, materials uh, are uh, from uh, my are available in my website iitnoise.com, where we have in our laboratory uh, many of the NDT technique instruments like uh, thermal imaging camera and ultrasonic probe, uh, acoustic emission system, etcetera. Of course, to use uh, gamma rays uh, and uh, it requires uh, certification by the uh, nuclear authorities, gamma rays because of the radioactive material we need from the uh, department of atomic energy in our country. Whether uh, we can uh, store radioactive, uh, what care has been taken because you know the radioactive material after uh, they have uh, uh, their useful life is over, they have to be <coughs> properly disposed of. So, there are issues of that, and I would not go into that because <coughs> nuclear safety, radiation safety is another issue one has to be careful about while using these uh, materials, but uh, nevertheless we have to follow the strict federal uh, and uh, regulatory requirements which are there for safe handling of such uh, materials, disposing such materials, using them operation, uh, operation and so on. So, but then let us focus into x-rays uh, which are mostly used uh, in industrial systems to find out defects. So, the film darkness density will vary with the amount of radiation reaching the film through the test object. So, this is less exposure that is more exposure in the top view of the developed film. This is very similar to the x-rays uh, many of you would have done uh, at the hospitals where you had an uh, x-ray done to see the uh, got a film and this film uh, is nothing but again it is a process like an ordinary photographic film, but mind you this is again uh, done in a dark room wherein all the developing is done and then the film is washed uh, the chemicals are washed off the uh, photograph is dried and then of course the doctor puts it against light and sees where are the denser particle whether the dense particle being the bone in this case there is a crack etc so these kind of things can be done and similarly <coughs> in the film radiography which is used in the industry we can have a similar setup wherein the component under test is brought uh, down to this location here and then we have an extra film. But now it is because of the digital uh, image processing instead of film we have digital images and there are uh, devices or uh, the table wherein either you can have the suppose this is a uh, device either you can have the this is the x-ray source you can either have the x-ray source move around in a circular arc around the body or you can turn the body turn the body and then you can appropriately have an digital image capturing device. So, a 3 D x ray image can be obtained and this is what is known as the tomography. Okay. I know many of you would have done uh, dental x-rays, you know, if, the, if we, this is your the jaw okay, and then you have your teeth, you, you would have uh, seen one of the jaws, you can see the x-rays move uh, by a computer control and then you can get the entire image of all your teeth in one go rather than exposing it individually. So, this, this kind of modern techniques wherein this workpiece or material is put on a platform and a rotating platform is used 
or a rotating x ray source. So, depending on the convenience, this kind of uh, operations are possible. So, at the end of the day, we will get a 3D x ray for the uh, image for the material under test. So, these are some of the radiographic images of certain components. You can see these are all different uh, machine components and you can see if internal there are certain uh, metal systems because that you can you can notice the density difference. Uh, you can see from the back side this these are the uh, black IC chips full of uh, material uh, denser material. So, this denser material appear here as white objects similarly here the denser material object as a white objects here again. So, these are the uh, how the radiographic images or x ray images of machine components help us understand whether or what is there inside a material. So, uh, applications of radiography of course, the industrial applications is to find out the weld defect detection, casting defect detection, boiler tube inspection. In the industrial security systems, we use industrial x rays for scre screening baggages to find out the density, etcetera. Of course, these x ray systems sometimes you know uh, they are harmful to human beings. So, we are very careful about how much exposure time we give to that particular uh, component and then what is the distance of the x ray source to the component which is being tested. So, some of the safety precautions which we have to take during radiography, I mean on, on top of it if there is a gamma ray radiography or gamma, gamma ray um, testing, we have to be more careful about the nuclear radioactivity associated with such gamma rays. However, in the radiography because as I was telling you x rays cannot be seen, heard, smelled, okay. they can we have to be careful that the exposure to personal is avoided. Lead sheets which are thick heavy dense high density absorb x rays. So, you can you might have seen there are uh, suits lead suits which are worn by operators. So, that they are not exposed. Sealing of appropriate material thickness and I have, I have written the word here appropriate because that depends on the exposure time that depends on the density of the material because uh, and then we can decide on the thickness because there is also a component uh, known as penetration depth depth. Okay. This follows an uh, okay. this follows an uh, exponential curve because incentivity and this depends these are all, all on material property at any distance x the intensity of x ray is given by this and this is the penetration depth okay for different materials we can find out whether a half inch material is good enough or a one inch material is good enough to stop the penetration of the x rays so these these are available in handbooks for for uh, different materials penetration depth for different materials and usually uh, out of experience the operators know that uh, if I have a component surrounded by a material of a particular thickness and then the x rays are ap appropriately absorbed and then nothing is going to go wrong. So, there has to be always an option to control the power of the x ray and the exposure time by power you know you can you can control the voltage to the electrode for generating x ray and how much of exposure time is given. Those of you who would have gone to a um, for a medical x ray you know, they, there is a button and the guy presses and there is a light which will glow and then once the x ray exposure is over the light will go off. So, that gives you, you know may, maybe it is uh, maybe 2 seconds or 5 seconds you know depending on or, or you know, 1 second depending on the power and exposure time and the uh, technicians the there the x ray operators they know for a human x ray how much is the time to be given 
and of course, same is true for an industrial x ray. We also have to control the exposure time and the power. Of course, with the careful uh, one note which has to be one has to be careful about is whether the exposure is so high that the, a lot of heat is being generated. So, there are extra systems where it requires intense cooling of the uh, cathode ray tube. Okay. Now, I will come to another technique which is used as an NDT technique that is the liquid penetrant inspection. So, uh, this is uh, altogether different than radiography, but these are also used particularly when we have a lot of casting. For example, uh, engine cylinder block, you know the engine cylinder blocks are usually cast, it looks something like this. Okay. These are the so, so three cylinder engine, then there, these are these are actually holes okay. and then this is where your cylinder piston are there, this is the piston and then the connecting rod and then this is the crankshaft etcetera. And these blocks are actually cast and then there are water jackets you know casted here. And if there is a crack on this casting on the top, and because there will be gas pressures, gas pressures at uh, high pressures and forces, things with time will leak out. Okay. So, we have to avoid such surface cracks or cracks which are very, very fine, which cannot be perhaps seen by our naked eyes. So, that is where a uh, liquid penetrant inspection is done usually to find out such cracks. So, a liquid with high surface weighting characteristics is applied to the surface of the part and allowed to seep into surface breaking defects. Okay. So, if a uh, liquid is there it, it will seep in and then it will uh, come up to the surface and then we can know the defects. And then the process is this excess liquid is removed from the surface of the part by uh, a developer and then actually a developer is applied to pull the trapped penetrant out the defect and spread it onto the surface where it can be seen. So, basically if I was to think of a material where there is a crack very thin line crack very thin line crack like this. So, I will I will put a liquid the green one is the liquid here and then this liquid is going to come out to the surface. So, I can put a developer this is my liquid. So, this comes onto the surface which can be picked up by a developer. A good example would be you know if there was a crack okay, and then uh, you, you poured uh, some blue ink onto it and if I roll a piece of blackboard chalk. Okay. So, the chalk would get the mark of that liquid there. So, this is kind of the principle of this liquid penetrant inspection. Only thing is that sometimes I can have this developer as a chemical. Sometimes this developer can be seen through some other things like a visual inspection is the final step in the process. The penetrant is often loaded with a fluorescent dye and the inspection is done under UV light to increase the test sensitivity. So, this is the penetrant has a dye which glows under UV light. So, we, we pour the or rub the surface with such penetrants and wherever and then clean it and wherever there is a crack this penetrant is going to seep in and then uh, it, it will come out to the surface and we can see it as a glow under UV light. So, very easily you can, you can see a crack surface is can, can be seen. Okay. This is where we are 
putting a powder based developer. This is a fluorescent type developer which is being used to find out the defects in the system. Okay. So, dye penetrant is a very, very easy and quick method to locate no surface cracks. Locate and detect surface cracks which are otherwise not visible to naked eye. So, this developer can be a powder and the dye penetrant can be made to glow under UV light. Okay. So, this is how dye penetrant and this are usually done to find out surface cracks in casting. All kind of surface cracks can be detected by such UV uh, lights. So, because uh, so why do we use liquid penetrant? Because it improves the detection of minor surface cracks by increasing their visibility and size. Okay, and it provides a contrast against the background. Usually, this uh, background of a material is very dull. I mean, uh, imagine we have a very dark black component, machine component. Very dull black machine component. And if there is a surface crack on it, it may not be visible, may not be visible okay, to naked eye. So, if we do this dye penetrant, apply dye penetrant on this surface cracks and then either have a developer which is a powder or whether we have a glowing dye penetrant, this on this dull black surface this will glow and so it provides a contrast against a background and then we can detect the surface crack. So, some of the uh, basic steps which have to be followed while applying the liquid penetrant is we have to prepare the surface as if there are no rough surfaces to feel. We have to nicely clean it, degrease it okay, and then penetrant is applied. Penetrant is let to dwell for some time, so that it actually seeps into the crack or voids uh, which are there on the surface and then the excess penetrant is uh, removed by you know just cleaning and wiping it off on a piece of cloth and then a uh, developer is applied. Okay. And once we apply the developer, this uh, dye which has oozed out of the crack will form an impression on the developer and then this developer can then be inspected uh, and then of course, the surface can be cleaned. So, uh, in the uh, you can have of course, nowadays you know there are high uh, resolution cameras Okay, but then the cameras, the problem is unless there is a contrast with the background, we may not be possible for us to detect the uh, surface defects. And uh, so, many uh, places, particularly in production work, um, production plants, where series of uh, components are being casted and uh, going to, for example, an engine plant. You know, I, I know of an engine plant where they were doing this. And every uh, engine block which came out of that plant was being sprayed by a dye, okay. and then it was uh, w wiped off. And then the entire cylinder block was be, was exposed to UV lights. Okay. And the, by by a quick, I mean somebody with an UV light actually moves around and sees. And wherever he sees a glow, he knows that there is a crack. 
okay, and that is how quick testing of cracks is done. Because imagine if you have bought an engine and there is a minute crack which goes undetected, uh, you can understand the consequence once you have bought a new car and your cylinder block uh, leaks out uh, the charge or the lubricating oil or the coolant, what a mess it would be. Okay. Uh, nowadays, you know, vehicle manufacturers you know, guarantee that nothing is going to go wrong with your car for 100,000 kilometers, kilometers. So, to take that into account, one has to be careful that such uh, cracks do not seep in because of obvious many reasons, maybe because of a thermal difference uh, while uh, casting, uh, because of some uh, material in homogeneity, this crack has happened. So, uh, every cylinder block because you know uh, once uh, how is the engine manufacturing once the cylinder block comes into place they put in all the different components the piston cylinder liners you know the um, valves etc but before that the very basic casting itself has to be checked and this can be very easily done through a liquid dye penetrant test that is you know you expose uh, you you coat or spray with a dye penetrant and then see it under uv light and that is what you can do. Of course, innovations can be done to liquid dye penetrant tests because we nowadays we have uh, high resolution uh, digital cameras and all this uh, we can have an totally uh, vision based systems of course, that, that will bring us to the next uh, uh, line of our uh, NDT technique and in fact, the last technique of NDT which I will be discussing today is just the plain visual inspection and whether we can take the help of uh, imaging systems, optical systems to have a better image or better viewing of a machinery component or inspect a material uh, machinery component. So, factors influencing the penetrant dwell time is the surface tension of the penetrant, the contact angle of the penetrant, the dynamic shear viscosity of the penetrant which can vary with the diameter of the capillary the viscosity of a penetrant in microcapillary flaws is higher than its viscosity in bulk, which slows the infiltration of the tight flaws. The atmospheric pressure at the flow opening, the capillary pressure at the flow opening, the pressure of the gas trapped in the flow, uh, flow by the penetrant, the radius of the flow or the distance between the flow walls, the density or specific gravity of the penetrant, microstructural properties of the penetrant. So, we have to be careful about these things which we will influence the penetrant dwell time. Okay. Some of the materials which are commonly tested by LPI unlike the eddy current or the ultrason uh, eddy current where it has to be a, a magnetic ferritic material and ultrasonic uh, it could be any material. Materials commonly tested by liquid penetrant inspection are any kind of metals plastics, rubber, ceramics, glass there is no end to it provided your liquid penetrant can actually seep in to the cracks and it can let we can let it to dwell and then uh, ooze out. So, that if there is a glow uh, if there is a dye in that penetrant it can glow under UV light or I can apply a developer. So, that this uh, this liquid is going to get leave an impression on the developer. Some of the common flaws detected by LPI or liquid penetrant inspection are the fatigue cracks, the quenching cracks during heat treatment, grinding cracks, overload and impact failures, porosity, lapse, sims, pinholes in welds. Uh, th these are some things very, very too small to even uh, detect uh, carefully with uh, ultrasonics or eddy current because the resolutions here are so fine that we it may be in the noise floor of an ultrasonic or an uh, eddy current system. So, this kind of tests a very minute thin hairline kind of cracks on the surface can be very easily detected by LPI. Okay. So, advantages of LPI is the method has high sensitivity to small surface discontinuities which was not there in the case of the eddy current or the uh, ultrasonics. The method has few material uh, limitations, example metallic, non-metallic, magnetic and non-magnetic, conductive and non-conductive may be inspected. Large areas and large volumes of parts materials can be inspected rapidly and at low cost. Parts with complex geometry shapes are routinely inspected. Indications are produced directly on the surface of the part 
and constitute a visual representation of the flaw. Aerosol spray cans make penetrant materials very portable. Penetrant materials and associated equipment are relatively inexpensive. Okay. So, some of the disadvantages of uh, LPI only surface de breaking defects can be detected, only materials with a relatively non porous surface can be inspected. Pre cleaning is critical since components can mask defects. Metal smearing from machining, grinding, and grit or vapor blasting must be removed prior to LPI. The inspector must have direct access to the surface being inspected. Surface finish and roughness can affect inspection sensitivity. Multiple process operations must be performed and controlled. Post cleaning of acceptable parts or materials is required. Chemical handling and proper disposal is required. Okay, and this is one of the image of a fluorescent penetrant on a connecting rod. Now, I will come to the last technique of visual inspection. Uh, what essentially it does is uh, we can have boroscopes, fiber uh, scopes, magnifying glasses and mirrors to see components which are not visible to us from the outside. So, we can have uh, cameras built in like we have to do a pipeline inspection, we want to do a cylinder uh, internal dimension checking like similar to you know, doctors uh, putting in a camera in a tube and doing a surgery. So, this kind of visual inspection aided by uh, cameras, magnifying glasses and mirrors and uh, of course, now we have also portable cameras, video cameras which can be put in robots uh, and then uh, inspected uh, places where humanly it is not possible for somebody to go in. For example, inside a pipeline which is uh, um, conveying crude oil or um, some sort of a uh, liquid, we would like to inspect the internals. So, we can move in a camera uh, or robotic controlled cameras. So, these are uh, what people also use for NDT visual uh, inspection techniques. So, so, with this I would like to bring to an end uh, the module on NDT and uh, we will uh, we basically looked in the four uh, lectures on NDT techniques on acoustic emission, uh, ultrasonics, thermography, eddy current, uh, acoustic emission and of course, now uh, radiography as well. Thank you.